So for this month's video blog, I'd like to tell you the iconic archetypal story of the Handless Maiden. Oh, what a tale, what a tale. Um, so I'm going to just begin it and then perhaps afterwards we'll I'll say a little bit about some of its many layered meanings. Once upon a time. Once upon a time, once upon a time, there was a miller who lived uh, by an old run-down mill in the forest with his wife and his daughter. The mill had fallen into disrepair. The family had become very poor. They didn't have the money to fix the mill. The great water wheel that spun, that would have ground the flour for the whole village, had fallen into disrepair. It had stopped working and... His wife was having to grind the flour by hand and it was terribly labour intensive and, uh, and uh, they didn't have much money as a result. So they were living in uh, difficult conditions and in poverty, really, a sort of uh, simple poverty, you might say. But one day the miller went into the forest near the house and he was gathering kindling. While he was gathering kindling, a strange being slid out of the forest behind him. They say it was a strange forest man, a denizen of the dark woods, who floated a few inches off the ground, smelt of sulphur, hollowed out dark eyes. I'm sure you get who it is. But anyway, he surprised the miller and the miller jumped up and the forest man said, don't worry, don't be afraid. I've been watching you for a very long time from the edge of this forest. And I can see how you struggle. But you know, I have great powers and I could actually restore your mill to full working order. I can fix the wheel and I can also make great wealth appear in your life. And the miller said, well, that's fantastic. Um, yes, please. What's the deal? Even the miller knows there must be a bargain to be struck. And this strange old being of the forest, this denizen, he said, Look, I just want to do this for you. You know, I can see what's going on and I have the power and I can fix it. He said, uh, all I really want in return is whatever is in the, the garden at the back of the house. Just give me what's right at this moment, what is in the garden at the back of the house. And the miller thought to himself, well, there's really only the old apple tree in the garden. So... He agreed. He shook hands on it. And the, the, um, the strange forest being <clears throat> said, well, I'm just going to give you a week to really think about this bargain, what it really means. But meanwhile, if you turn around and walk home now, you will enter a different life. Well, the miller was terribly happy. And as he was walking back down the hill to the house, his wife came running up the hill and she said, you won't believe it, you won't believe it. The, the water wheel is fixed. The wheel is turning again. Uh, and the house is full of beautiful things, fine linen, and there is a banquet on the table. Uh, it's as though wealth has arrived in the house. I don't know how. It's happened. We have new dresses, you have new clothes. There's money in the in that empty drawer. Well, they returned to prosperity. They returned to prosperity. But of course she asked him, how did this happen? And he told her about the strange forest being and the bargain they had struck. And that he was to let her have what was in the garden, let him have what was in the garden at the back of the house. And just at that moment, the daughter came from.
from the back garden and they realised she'd been there all the time, sweep, sweep, sweeping under the apple tree. And the miller realised with a terrible, piercing, sinking heart that he had traded his own daughter for the devil. Now, of course, a week went by and the daughter prepared herself. She did not object to the deal that was done. She was glad to see her parents affluent once again, not suffering. Even the village prospered because they were now grinding flour for the whole village. But the day came when this strange denizen of the dark woods arrived to collect his side of the bargain. And the daughter came out of the house and she stood outside there, drew a circle of chalk around herself. She was dressed in pure white. She was absolutely clean, pure, beautiful. And the devil, the denizen, he couldn't get near her. He was jumping up and down, sulfur coming out of his ears. He was absolutely furious. He said, I can't have her when she's this pure and I can't get past the magic of this circle. It is too bright, it is too white. Now, we had a deal. So I'm going to go away and I'm going to come back next week. And when you present her again, I want her dirty. I want her smutty. And there is no chalk, no circle. So off he went. And the following week, of course, out she came. And she was muddied up and her clothes were dirty. She was dishevelled. Her hair was all in knots. And as she stood there and she saw him coming, she started to cry. And she wept those great oceanic tears that only deep grief can really produce. And her face was so awash with tears, she used her hands to wipe her face and to wipe her body. And she wiped herself clean. And the devil was absolutely furious. He said, I can't have her when she's clean. He said, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to come back next week. And this time he spoke to the father, to the miller. And he said, you are going to take that silver axe, that little silver axe you keep, the back of the shed, the one that you cut her umbilical cord with when she was born. And you're going to cut off the hands. You're going to take the hands off so there'll be no interference. No wiping, no nothing. And you'll bring her out to me. Father cutting off his daughter's hands. Well, the following week he came back. They brought her out. And as agreed, the bargain with the devil, the father sliced off that sharp silver axe his own daughter's hands. Not once did she object. But that poor girl then felt so out of place, so disfigured, so out of place. And all the visitors that came and all the, to enjoy the wealth and the food and the affluence of the family, she would sit in the middle feeling so, so uncomfortable. She knew she didn't belong there anymore. And so one night she left the house and she went to the darkest edge of the forest where there wasn't even a path and she disappeared into it. And for years she wandered in that forest, the handless maiden. Every now and again, when she was really starving, couldn't even find berries or nuts to chew upon, a bird would come, a bird would come and drop something, a little bit of meat, a little bit of just enough to keep her going. Until one night, after many years of wandering and wandering, she came suddenly to the edge of the forest and found herself staring at a glade in the middle of the forest lit up in the silvery moonlight 
And in the glade, in the forest, was an orchard. And the orchard was full of pears and apples. It was surrounded by a moat right there in the middle of the forest. She couldn't believe it. It had been so long since she'd stepped out of the trees, but she saw the pears and she had her heart set on one of those beautiful, beautiful, juicy pears. And it is said that night, the waters of the moat parted for her. And with her long held hunger, she approached the pear tree and she took a pear in her mouth and she carried it back to the forest. And she ate that beautiful, juicy pear. It was nectar after all those years living on almost nothing. Well, now it just so happens that that orchard belonged to a king. And it just so happened that the night the handless maiden stepped into the orchard <clears throat> to take the pear, the king's gardener, had been working there very late at night, tending this beautiful orchard. Now, the thing the king, and of course he saw what happened. Now, the thing the king loved to do was the king used to come to the orchard every day and he used to count the fruit, the apples and the pears. It was just the thing he did. He just loved to watch each one grow and change and how uh, uh, when they were ready for the picking, but uh, he counted them. And he came the next morning and he was counting 101, 102. And he turned to the gardener, he said, one of the pears is missing. Do you know anything about this? And the gardener told him what he'd seen the night before. And the king was so entranced by what the gardener told him. He was so mystified. He said, right, I have to see this for myself. So the next night he waited. He waited in the garden. He hid and she came to the edge of the forest. And as it was the night before, the water of the moat parted. And this strange being that she had now become, thistle-haired, birds nesting on her shoulders, strange bits of wood coming out of her clothes. She was a strange, she'd become a strange mystical forest being herself. Still no hands. And as she went to the pear tree, the king saw her as she really was. And he instantly fell in love with her. So the king approached this strange, mystical, beautiful being, very gently, very carefully. And although she was startled, he said, it's okay, it's okay, I, I'm the king. I actually own this orchard, but you're very welcome to eat the pears. You can have as many pears as you like. He said, but you know, I have a castle just here and I would really like you to come Come there with me and let me take care of you. You'll have everything you need. You'll have beautiful dresses, servants, rooms. You will, you will be at home. You, you will be safe there and you can have a normal life again. So she agreed. And she went with him back to the castle and all was as he had promised. Servants, fine things. Good food again, pears. But when she was there, she said, you know, I can't really run a castle without my hands. And so the king loved her so much, he went to his silversmith and he had made for her a beautiful, beautiful pair of fine silver hands and he gave them to her. And in due course, the cloak of love wrapped itself around their shoulders and she fell in love with him and they were married. 
and in their beautiful cuddling, she fell pregnant. So there was a great joy in the castle. But during the pregnancy, she began to feel sad. The grieving returned because she wanted to be able to hold the baby with her own warm mother's hands. But she, hil she hid her sadness from the king because she knew how happy he was. But right in the middle of her pregnancy, he was called away to war. Now, the, the farewell was, was tragic. They loved each other deeply and it was a terrible goodbye, never knowing if she would see him again. But he galloped away with his armies and she continued at the castle with her pregnancy. But over time she became more and more grief stricken about the fact that she didn't have her own hands. But eventually she gave birth to a beautiful baby boy. Imagine her grief that she could not hold the child. There was a great happiness that this baby was born, but she was still racked with grief that she couldn't hold the baby with her own warm hands. And eventually, one night, she took that child and she went back into the forest. And for years, once again, she wandered in that forest and she and the child became part human, part animal. They were fed by the birds. They were helped by all manner of creatures. But they wandered and they wandered until one day, suddenly she saw smoke coming up out of the trees. And to her enormous surprise, when she followed it, she found in the middle of the forest a great longhouse, an ancient cottage. And she went and she knocked on the door. And the door opened and she was met by a silver-haired woman who looked at her and said, Ah, we've been waiting for you. And she opened the door and invited her in. And in the cottage there were other women cooking, weaving, laughing, baking bread. And the, the handless maiden stayed with those women and she raised her child in that house amongst the gossip and the laughter and the handmade lives that they were all weaving. Now the king returned from war to find his wife and child had gone. So he set off immediately in pursuit and he too entered the forest. And for seven long years, he looked for his wife and child. He never gave up. And one day when he too had birds nests on his shoulders, and thistles in his hair, and all the kingly attire had worn away. And he was also a man of the forest. One day he too saw the smoke coming from the chimney. And he found his way to that long house, that ancient cottage where the forest women dwelt. And he knocked on the door and there they were. But what he did not know was that during the time she was in that cottage and over the years with the women baking, gossiping, cooking, weaving their handmade lives, somehow her hands had grown back. Bit by bit by bit, her real hands had grown back. And when the king and the queen were united, she was able to cup his face in her warm hands. She was able to hold him. And they were reunited in a great loving. 
And as far as I know, they never went back to that gilded cage, that silvered castle, with all its trappings of wealth and affluence. They stayed in the forest, in the long house, with the handmade lives that were woven there, amongst the trees and the animals and the birds. And they lived happily ever after. <laughs>